Welcome to the Jason Podcast. I'm Josie Briggs, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. Each month in this podcast, we talk about a topic that is reflected in one or more of the papers in the current issue. We always do this with the hope the discussion will prompt you, our listeners, to go to our website or turn to the latest issue that's now in your mailbox. The paper we are going to talk about today is entitled Effect of SGLT2 Inhibitors on Discontinuation of Renin-Angiotensin System Blockade, a Joint Analysis of the Credence and DAPA-CKD Trials. Joining me today is Brandon Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen is the first author on this paper. He is a staff specialist, nephrologist, and director of the Kidney Trials Unit at the Royal North Shore Hospital and senior research fellow at the George Institute for Global Health. He's also a former editorial fellow with the Jason team. Dr. Nguyen, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for having me, Dr. Briggs. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here with you again on the Jason podcast. So you and I are returning from the ASN Kidney Week, and I gather you were also at the American Heart Association meetings. There's certainly a feeling of excitement in nephrology right now about new drugs, a lot of new options and a lot of exciting trial results. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Josie. I think um, at ASN, real theme that emerged was all the therapeutic uh, focus on IgA nephropathy, new clinical trials, new randomized evidence in that space, particularly with the use of endothelin receptor antagonists, which will expand beyond IgA to other um, adjacent uh, diseases in, in nephrology. And really exciting time, uh, not only for clinicians, but uh, for people with CKD. And of course, I was at AHA as well. And very large randomized evidence in cardiovascular medicine, which is also really inspiring as a trialist. Right. Uh, we all at times have a little cardiology envy. They have a lot of trials happening. Uh, so the paper we're talking about today is a meta-analysis of two major trials of the FLOSIS. It was published actually about three years ago. But I think it would be helpful to remind our listeners about the major findings from these two trials, Credence and DAPA-CKD. Of course. So um, as many of your listeners will know, Credence and DAPA-CKD were two uh, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, event-driven outcome trials that evaluated the effects of the SGLT2 inhibitors, canagliflozin and dapagliflozin, compared to placebo in people with albuminuric chronic kidney disease. In the case of Credence, everyone with diabetes and kidney disease, and with DAPA-CKD, one-third of people with proteinuric non-diabetic kidney disease. Both these trials, uh, at the time of first in nephrology, were stopped early for overwhelming efficacy based on pre-specified stopping rules at interim analyses. And so these, in addition with empikidney, these trials have established SGLT2 inhibitors as foundational therapy alongside RAS blockade for slowing kidney disease progression in people with diabetic and non-diabetic proteinuric chronic kidney disease. In addition, they have shown favorable effects on cardiovascular events. So a really important development in nephrology and uh, a tool in our, arm, our armamentarium to slow kidney disease progression. A great summary. So the meta-analysis you did asked a very specific question, which was, in the trial setting, did we learn anything about whether SGLT inhibitors would allow or facilitate persistent use of RAS blockade? in CKD patients. Why is this a key question? So, um, Josie, as you know, it's been 20 years since IDNT and Renal re effectively established RAS blockade as foundational therapy for chronic kidney disease. But in the intervening period, we know that these agents have still remained underused. And there was that beautiful analysis that you published in Jason back in 2019 by Daniel Murphy, looking at trends in the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs in the United States and showed that their use had plateaued by 
about 2010 with a substantial number of people in whom the drug is indicated, the drugs are indicated not receiving one. And if you look at um, kind of analogous uh, epidemiological um, data from other countries around the world, including in low and middle income countries, you see exactly the same pattern and under use of ACE inhibitors and AIBs in people with chronic kidney disease. And part of the reason for that is probably because they're often discontinued because of hyperkalemia, acute kidney injury or hospitalization. And so with all the data from the SGLT2 inhibitor trials, we showed, we found that SGLT2 inhibitors reduce all of these events, hyperkalemia, they reduce hospitalization, they reduce acute kidney injury. So we hypothesized that SGLT2 inhibitors might enable more persistent use of RAS blockade and therefore continue to improve outcomes. This has long been an important question that we've uh, tried to address in nephrology, how to enable persistent use of RAS blockade, but haven't yet found really um, clear answers. So Brendan, summarize for our listeners the major findings of your meta-analysis of these two studies. So uh, we conducted a joint analysis of Credence and DAPA CKD, where we evaluated the effect of randomization to SGLT2 inhibitor versus placebo on the main outcome of temporary or permanent discontinuation of ACE inhibitors or ARBs. So that was at least four weeks or longer. And what we found was that for participants who are randomized to an SGLT2 inhibitor, they had a lower incidence of temporary or permanent discontinuation of RAS blockade with a 15% relative risk reduction in RAS discontinuation overall. And we, when we looked at the consistency of that risk reduction across different subgroups, including levels of GFR, dosing of RAS blockade and baseline potassium, we found consistent effects. But interestingly, we found a more pronounced effect in people with higher levels of albuminuria. And this is an important finding because it's exactly these types of patients who derive the greatest absolute benefits from continuing RAS blockade. And so we found that this find this uh, persistent use of RAS blockade was particularly prominent in uh, people with higher levels of albuminuria. Right. You know, we all know that uh, in the trials uh, of RAS blockade, there's an immediate fall in most patients in GFR. And uh, but the question of, of whether a, a, a bump in creatinine, a fall in eGFR is actually an early AKI warning is one that, that really bothers uh, clinicians. And of course, worsening hypokalemia is another a uh, problem. There have been a number of very strong studies that have attempted to take on the question of, of continuing RAS uh, it, it, as kidney disease progresses. Can I ask you to, to give our listeners at least some of the highlights of work uh, that have addressed the safety of RAS blockade in people with advancing disease? Yeah, so... Um... There was a very important trial that was published uh, last year after um, Kidney Week that evaluated the question of whether it was called the STOP ACE trial and it evaluated the question of whether to continue or discontinue RAS blockade in people with advanced CKD. And this trial enrolled about 400 people uh, with proteinuric chronic kidney disease and randomized them to stopping or continuing their ACE inhibitor or ARB. And what the trial found was there was no difference in the rate of GFR decline with stopping or continuing um, ACE inhibitors or ARBs. But interestingly, from a cardiovascular point of view, there was a numerical increase in the incidence of cardiovascular events in people who stopped their ACE inhibitor or ARB. And that's um, a really in important, I think, an interesting finding. And this is one great example, I think, where really carefully conducted epidemiological analyses using target trial emulation techniques that um, Edward Fu has written about in the journal has really complemented the randomized evidence and found effectively the same signal. And so I think that gives us much more confidence in continuing or using RAS inhibitors, the foundational therapy for slow kidney disease progression, even in people with very advanced CKD. And when you look to the SGLT2 inhibitor trials two decades later, um, 
some of the listeners might know that in these trials, uh, everyone continued therapy. They didn't stop when their GFR fell below 30, so all the way down to dialysis. And so I think both the, these two forms of evidence are really complementary and, and, and get to that idea of continuing renal protective therapies, even in advanced CKD, if possible, um, if, if there are no issues with hyperkalemia, et cetera. So uh, a really important randomized evidence. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned the trial emulation approaches. I, I do think, uh, particularly when combined with trial data, that they're so important. It, we, we all know that trials are done with a level, or particularly drug trials are done with a level of frequent control uh, and nurse coordinators checking on patients and so on. So their external generalizability is, is often something it's right to worry about. And I, I think the trial emulation techniques are, are an incredibly uh, valuable. Uh, yeah. I, they don't substitute, but they complement. Um, I completely agree with you. They have a place. They they're complementary, especially when they're well done. They it's always uh, challenging to draw causal inferences from observational data, and we have to be very careful about that. But you know, this is one good example where it's been uh, quite helpful and consistent with the randomised evidence. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so. This still means, as we see this uh, array of new agents, uh, that we have a lot of unsolved questions. Uh, I, I wonder if I can ask you to just uh, uh, talk uh, uh, freely on what if you think about the issues that are involved in combining RAS blockade with SGLT inhibitors. We won't get into endothelium receptor blockers now, we won't get into GLP-1, uh, but let's just talk on these two, two drugs. What kind of trial would you want to see that would uh, help uh, the hard decisions about how to combine these two drugs? So I think um, now because everyone in Credence and DAPA CKD was on RAS block blockade already and the benefits was observed on top of almost universal RAS blockade. We've got very clear evidence that at least this combination is uh, effective, more effective than either alone. Um, so that's uh, really important. But I think when, when we have newer or with additional therapies, it's going to be important to test their combination effects. And, you know, one good example we have uh, that's ongoing at the moment is the CONFIDENCE trial. That is evaluating uh, empagliflozin and phenarinone in combination mm -hmm. and, importantly, simultaneous initiation in people with proteinuric diabetic kidney disease. And those are the kinds of trials that will not, not only give us important efficacy information, information at, at least from a proteinuria point of view, but will give us important safety information because we know that these drugs have acute hemodynamic effects uh, that differ from their long-term effects. Um, and so that information is really important. The, uh, another key question that is not just the combination, but how you sequence and initiate them. And, and I think trials like confidence are really important. We're going to need to do more of those as a community. Um, and of course, uh, with each, as time passes, hopefully the background use of SGLT2 inhibitors will increase um, over time. I hope substantially very quickly. Um, and that will give us additional power to test whether these uh, the effects of newer therapies are independent or consistent regardless of background use of SGLT2 inhibitors. So I think there are multiple, going to be multiple strategies to evaluate that question. We need new trials. We need the background use of SGLT2 inhibitors to increase so that we can do subgroup analyses with new therapies. And that that those two forms of evidence are going to be complementary. Yeah, the, there's questions throughout the entire uh, phases of progression of disease. Uh, most of what we're concentrating on right now is is proteinuric patients with proteinuria. Mm. Uh, 
do you think these agents are worth is is there discussion of testing these agents in advanced CKD in individuals with outproteinuria? That would be one question. Yeah, I I don't think we're going to see another uh, trial, a, a big trial, at least nothing as big as uh, DAPA CKD and EMPA kidney in people with uh, low GFR and low levels of proteinuria. Um, uh, but and so probably at least for in the short to medium term, the evidence from ember kidney is the best that we've got. And in those, um, and although there was some evidence that the effects on kidney disease progression were attenuated at lower levels of albuminuria, um, there were fewer kidney disease progression events. And when you look yeah. at the continuous outcome of GFR slope, there seemed to suggest uh, relative benefits on slope in even in people with lower levels of albuminuria so i it, it is a difficult population to study because the rates of ckd progression are, are often quite slow in normal albuminuric patients and thus our ability to detect, detect treatment effects in that group uh, are, uh, are more limited um, so i think it's always going to be a really challenging uh, group to study not to say that it's not an important group to study but it's just um, it is a bit harder to um, generate sufficient power to detect treatment effects on CKD progression endpoints yeah. in that group. Absolutely. Uh, I think that one final point that it's perhaps worth reminding our listeners about is that as they think about how to use these drugs in their own patients, they do need to be aware of costs. A lot. We're all still horrified where these drugs are being priced. Uh, the RAS blockade drugs are not uh, old enough that they're relatively low cost, um, but, but costs are something uh, no practicing physician can afford to ignore because uh, their patients will really? be yeah. influenced by that. Yeah. Any comments? So yeah, I, I mean, no question. I think cost is a major barrier to the wider adoption of SGLT2 inhibitors. It's going to be, at least in the United States, it's going to be a big barrier with with newer therapies. Um, and I think without addressing that, um, it's going to be difficult to make uh, inroads into, um, you know, reducing the incidence of kidney failure. Um, the challenge for us is, you know, how, how can we address costs, not only costs, but remove barriers or access, uh, remove barriers to accessing care. That's a major is issue too. focusing on health equity, targeting you know, upstream factors. If you can address all of those things, you can really make a big impact on um, the incidence of kidney failure with all of these new therapies. So that has got to be a focus, you know, implementation and equity. But having said all of those things about cost, if we look at um, lower cost therapies for cardiovascular and kidney disease that are now generic, we still see large implementation gaps in some settings. And we know that with SGLT2 inhibitors, at least in some jurisdictions, they're already available generic or they will be very soon be available generic in, in the United States. And so that you, not only thinking about cost, but more broadly about what the barriers are, barriers are to effective implementation at scale are going to be really critical to realising the societal or population benefits of these agents. And I think we need to start thinking now about how we're going to test strategies to improve access, increase uptake, uh, ideally using randomised study designs um, you know, the so-called implementation science, because that's how only by doing that, we're going to realize the benefits of these therapies at a population level. Yeah, we we continue to have just horrifying socioeconomic determinants, determining outcomes and, and indeed access. Okay, this is a, an excellent study, Your an important contribution. Um, one other thing I do want to say, we Really enjoyed having you uh, for two years as a member of our Jason editorial team, as an editorial fellow. Uh, you 
made uh, very valuable contributions throughout that period. Uh, and uh, I think the whole editorial team, uh, editor team said, we learned so much from the fellows. So, so, so thank you for the work you did for Jason as a fellow as well. Um, um, that was an absolute pleasure. I, um, it was a career highlight for me and I really enjoyed my time and learned a lot and uh, just what a fantastic experience. So thank you very much for having me. Well, you're very welcome. Uh, and go, listeners, go and look at this paper. Uh, it's an important topic. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology. All rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified healthcare professional if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug, changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast from the American Society of Nephrology.